All right. Um, hello, everybody. This is Al Kethus here from the World Series Committee um, with Maniacal Cackle for our championship interview. Welcome. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. Uh, love, love having you. This is this is really, really exciting. Um, we've uh, uh, just just generally, you've you've put in a lot of games. You've uh, participated in organizing the the series uh, through most of this year as part of the the committee. Um, now stepping down, um, and but luckily able to participate here in the in the finals in the championship. Um, what are some of your um, big takeaways from the series or favorite moments or, or anything of that nature? Thinking back to this year, how's it been? So from my personal favorite moments would be probably the uh, both the Guild Month and the Lucius Month, mm -hmm. uh, or the Neverborn Month, sorry. Because um, a lot of people were saying, oh, like Neverborn is really weak or oh, Guild Original Idols are really weak. And that's my favorite thing in Malifo is when you can win with the masters that people think are weak. So, so like, firstly, I really enjoyed being like, well, here's Nelly and Lucius, and I'm going to win with them. And I did do one round in the world. Um, so that was my personal favorite. And for the series as a whole, my favorite is just seeing the progress year on year, that, like, seeing that the uh, community is working to make it better and better every year. It's really great. Awesome. Yeah, I um, I mean, it's it's funny that, like, I don't think people think Nelly. People don't think Nelly's not strong anymore, right? Like she just, she just wins yeah, Carve a Path. Not. So like this is her, this is her time to shine. Did you? Yeah, um, yeah. For, that that interaction is what made me want to play Guild for that long. I was like, wow, this is this is pretty silly. Um, but it was interesting because she was underrepresented in the series uh, for a long while. I think she had games in the series this year and last year, right? Interesting. So, but I think it's also that she's kind of tricky to play, so people just didn't bother. Yeah, I don't know. I I love her. I mean, um, I I have been transitioning into guild and have been mostly playing Nelly, and she is so much fun for me. Not for anybody else, but for me, I have a lot of fun <laughs> playing Nelly. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, for sure. Did you ever get any? Um, I don't remember. Did you get any Lucius One games in this year? Uh, not not in the tournaments. So I did I did some practice ones, and I just, um, especially with the changeling changes, which really favor Lucius too. I just didn't feel like I could bring it together at the level of like you know competing with Malifaux Burns content. Right. I I absolutely have done tournaments soloing Lucius uh, pre Burns, but uh, with Malifaux Burns content, it was it was just a bit too much. Yep. Yeah, that's fair. Um. So I guess, you know, moving to our, our next uh, topic here and, and sort of talking about that um, or talking about your play style in, in particular, you are known for your out of keyword stuff. Um, and, um, it, you know, through this event specifically, you you played like out of keyword Yan Lo um, and are now... Um, now sitting at, at this point people know that the, the match is going to be molly versus versus wong so you're you're also very well known for your out of keyword molly lists and um i i guess uh you know jan obviously just went through some changes so we don't have to talk about that that um uh, that context anymore he's maybe a little bit more keyword friendly now but in as a big picture idea like how do you feel about super friends and, and out of keyword hiring and Malifo? Like, why is that your specialty? What brings you to it? Uh, I think, yeah. So to differentiate, I guess, between super friends and like out of keyword teching, um, super friends, I think is potentially a problem. If, if, if there is a model that everyone looks at and says, I am going to hire this model in every crew. That's what I would define. I think it's, it's usually a problem. And it's yeah. either an indicator of that model is too powerful or it's an indicator of a gap. Uh, a good example of a gap is, uh, say, um, uh, Serena Bowman for a long time was the primary healer in Neverborn, and so she, part of the reason she appeared everywhere is just there were no other healer options if you if you wanted a healer. Um, other things that are sometimes too powerful, I think Valedictorian might be in that category. Uh, like, yeah, no, she is in that category. I don't think she's top priority for a nerf, but I don't think it would be unreasonable to nerf Valedictorian. 
Uh, so that's that's the super friends one. They're so good you can slot them into any list it's, and it's strong. That's that's not that's just a problem in my mind. What I think is really my play style and what I shoot for and what I really, really enjoy is being really, really flexible with list building and operating off the principle that I'm not playing a master, I'm playing a faction. Yeah. And if I'm playing a faction, I want to use each and every single tool that is at my disposal. If I look at my enemy crew and I say they cannot handle a hanged, uh, or I the way I predict they will build will not be uh, good at fighting hanged, then I might hire hanged. If they, uh, uh, if I have a pool that um, what I really need is places, then I'm looking at Mono Sarchi Valedictorian. Uh, funnily enough, on Basil, you'll see those a bit more often because our boards often <laughs> require a lot of place movement to, to get around. Um, and so I think all up in Rezzers, there's at least 20 or 30 models that I've used out of keyword uh, or as versatiles. And so I think, to me, I think that's what makes Malifo great. I think it's really, really exciting that I can look at that many different models and find a use for all of them. Yeah. Cool. Um, do you think that that, like, obviously it makes your hiring a lot more versatile, right? Like if you have more options and, and you're, you're thinking about it from a faction perspective instead of from a, um, from a, a keyword perspective, you, you know, you bring the flexibility in your hiring farther into the pregame process. Um, so like, does that, where's the, where's the advantage the other way around, right? Like from, from someone who's, who's sitting, um, if, if you do lo like playing keywords, are you shit out of luck playing Malifaux? Like, <laughs> I, I think, like, honestly, the strongest uh, crews have very, very powerful keywords. Um, uh, Damien, Perdita, uh, who um, I don't believe got a nerf in this last Nerada unless I missed it. Um, they're good examples of, like, those crews can have, like, one versatile or zero versatile to move. And they, they will be absolute powerhouses. So I think there, there are a lot of crews. Uh, that you can play if you're a keyword thematic player, you're going to be perfectly happy. I also think that you can make thematic crews using Oof and Versatiles as an example. My Reva build, uh, I theme it around corpses. So I have like bone piles and great yeah. golems, beds and more, all of these things. Uh, so I think uh, the, what's really amazing about Alifo is that uh, here at the top table, we've got uh, Cap Shin Shen uh, and myself, and he's largely a keyword player. When he plays Molly, he plays her largely in keyword, and I am a very much a tech player. Yep. And there's room for both of us at the top tables, which I think is just incredible. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's that's probably one of the biggest reasons why this is one of the best games there is, is that yeah. play style matters. Play style matters, yeah. and if you're not enjoying and not like good at the type of type of master type of crew you're piloting you're you're not going to get as good results as if you do the thing that you're sort of inclined to do yeah definitely uh, and oh, one one other thing i should mention about um that out of keyword style is a lot of it is also related to the part where um i am really drawn to those masters that people feel are terrible and a lot of those masters just don't work in keyword sure. like um Guild Lucius one can work in keyword, but Guild Lucius, or sorry, Neverborn Lucius one does not work in keyword. <laughs> like, so there's there's just a lot of masters I think that that get opened up if, if you're a bit more flexible with your hiring. Yeah. Um. What uh you you mentioned you talked you you just mentioned that that Cap is known more for his keyword hire, um, and I think you played him when he was playing molly this year um so um i mean i guess what are your thoughts about um taking the t t now moving into talking about the the match specifically what are what are your thoughts in in terms of facing off against cap and and how do you what do you expect from a game with him and is there anything that you're like worried about you know what are the wrenches that cap could throw at you and and that sort of that sort of thing well, I think uh, on the end of like, I'm playing uh, Molly, like uh, Cap knows me decently well, um, and especially knows Molly, Molly really well. Uh, so Molly really, really well. Um, so I've uh, I've not presented Cap with any surprises, which is a bit of a downside. So I think he's going to be reasonably well prepared to see, see my list and be like, no. Um, so that's that's going to be one challenge I'll have to overcome. Whereas on the other end, uh, and part of the reason Cap Shen Shen plays, uh, 
Wong is because I have no idea. I've played Wong twice, and I have played against Wong maybe zero times, maybe once. Yeah. Um, and uh, he's got a real dark horse factor going there. Uh, so I think in terms of identifying my weakness as a player is when I don't know something, I'm not familiar with it. Sure. Uh, if you give me even, say, like, Damien level power levels, if I get to prepare for it, I can usually figure out something to do with it. Um, so he's he's hitting me where I'm weak there by uh, selecting a little something a little bit unpredictable. So how many times are you going to read Wong's card in the next, I think it's like 24 hours from now that your game's happening? So how, how many times can you go through that <laughs> card in this amount of time? Well, I'm going through a move at the moment, so I don't have access to much but my phone. So I'll be looking at the cards a lot. Ordinarily, what I would be doing here is I'd be looking at every video Cap has ever put on of him playing Wong. I would be watching it. I'd be studying his moves. Um, but unfortunately, I can't do that because uh, I'm moving. So we'll, I'll have a couple hour window where I'll have, where I'll have internet tomorrow. So it'll, it'll be going in a little, a little bit more blind than I normally would. Uh, but that said, I do have a general idea of the things to watch out for, and I think that's going to help. Cool. Um when you were picking um your master when you picked molly uh what were your biggest considerations going into the match well first off i was super stoked that we just had an errata and it brought a lot more balance into the game uh really positive things to say about this errata i think there's more to do still but really positive uh, and so one of the things that was really, really exciting to me was it was no longer like, oh, you have to declare the most powerful master you can. Like, as we saw in my round three match, when I didn't declare the most powerful master I could, it, it got a bit tricky, whereas here both Bayou and Metroid have had their strongest stuff nerf. So that felt really good. Uh, so that opened up my options. Uh, and But it was last minute. I did not have a lot of time to plan. Yeah. I did look at Jack Daw, was going to be really, really powerful here. I didn't have time to practice Jack Daw. He's not my, uh, I'm not like an S tier player with Jack Daw. So it basically was down to Molly and McMorning. Um, McMorning has some really positive things to say about the setup. He's really good on wedge. He likes covert. Um, Vendetta and In Your Face aren't great for him, but I, you know, you can play through those. Yep. Uh, the real devastating thing for McMorning was the board. Yeah. Whereas for Molly, Pool is great for her. Um, she's probably even a little bit better on covert than McMorning. Uh, it's probably her best strategy. And then on top of that, this board is just like places are the best thing you can bring to a match. And Molly is after now, now that uh, Yan Lo has been nerfed, Molly is probably one of the best masters in Rezzers for bringing places to the table. Sure. Um, and I, I know you don't have your, your um, you don't have Vassal up right now. Um, but uh, what um, specifically about the map and, and what, what were can you can you from memory talk about some of the challenges that the map um brought and and why you think molly can address that better than than like McMorgan yeah did? yeah for sure um and so this this applies to a lot of vassal tables because like some of our assets are a bit um a bit large and those sorts of things and we've been working on improving it we took some big steps forward this year but there's there's still some things so for instance there's like a train that i think is probably like 15 inches long uh there's uh some big big chunks of forest and especially those two trains uh, in the middle create like not a narrow choke point, but when you add up the forest, the trains, and you know fifty millimeter bodies gunking up that middle, yeah. what you end up with is is a, is a very congested board, and even even unimpeded, it's probably not quite going to be enough for it. Uh, so I think places are really king on this map. Um, and then there's some other uh, big considerations for this map as well. Uh, I'm doing this from memory, but I believe north south. Uh, in your deployment zones, you have the trains in front of you. Yep. So the advantage of that is that um, it allows you a safer unpack. It allows you to um, kind of dirtle a bit as you, you set up your game, and it protects you from opponents shooting you, shockwaves, those sorts of things. Um, whereas the east-west uh, deployment, uh, what you've kind of got there is three channels separated by the trains, and the game will then be split into three different war zones. Um, and so if I'm if I ended up against an opponent where I was going to uh think that they wanted to just brawl and just fight me, then what I want to do is I want to get a board that I can separate it into three separate war zones and I can play keep away. Yeah. Uh whereas say if he was Ophelia, where she also wants to do that, but I absolutely need cover, 
then I would maybe hide behind the train tracks and do north south. Um, and Molly's good at exploding both of those, so yeah. that's kind of why I thought, okay, she'll. Um, so what? Uh, do do you have a? Uh, you haven't seen uh, Cap's crew yet, but do you have a rough idea of which deployment zone you're going to pick? Uh, it'll basically come down to I'm pretty sure he's going to pick a crew that is better at crawling than I am. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to do the the triple lane east west uh, sort of setup. But if he picks something really, really skinny, or if I am worried that, oh, I don't understand his crew very well, I might die in my deployment zone, I'm going to go north south with the safe pick, I think. Sure. And, and is safe, um, you think safe is like, I guess, again, you can't see this, but do you remember if you were thinking top or bottom was the sort of safest zone? I can't quite remember. What I'm what I'm hoping to do is a little bit before my game, I'm going to measure it all out and, and, and do it. And what I'll be looking for, basically, is... Uh, for the models that I've hired, uh, and we're, we're, I'm still finalizing that, but for the models that I've hired, can they unpack? Yeah. Will be my first question. Uh, B, uh, how safe am I from shooting? Uh, and then C, uh, mid-game, am I able to reach my objectives mid-game and, and those sorts of things? Sure. And of course, I'll answer all those questions from his side, but in reverse, but like, oh, is this disruptive to his crew? Is this, uh, yeah. Um what are some of the things that you're worried about with Wong across the table? Yeah, so Wong, again, I think is is a really great pick into me because um, he can do so many things. It's very difficult to prepare a battle plan against him. <laughs> like, so like, uh, at least if it was Montucket, Montucket is one of the scariest masters in Bayou, but at least I know when playing Radic with Montucket, she's going to come and she's going to punch me in the face. Yeah. And there's nothing else that's going to happen. There's one possible event to plan for. Um, and that 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 I find for my play style that's easier to deal with. With Wong, uh, I'll try to list out some of the things I'm worried about. First off, that AOE with the Cataclysm trigger. If I do not space my crew out with you know like five inches in between each model, like I need to be. If if I clustered into the tip of the wedge, mm -hmm. my crew will be deleted first activation or second activation of turn right. one. But like so that so already I've got to be playing around that. Secondly. Uh, his crew uh, is probably a bit better than Brawling if he wants to build it uh, than mine is, uh, just because uh, his crew's got really, really good damage reduction, which uh, Molly's crew isn't great at dealing with. Molly herself, with the Irreducible, can be a threat, but um, then she has to deal with the concealing. And so uh, he's probably a bit better at Brawling if he uses like Alphonse and Swine Curse and those types of things. Uh, so he can put up really good fights. Uh, but then also Wong himself has the launch into space action, yeah. which he can use to put ski markers wherever he needs. Now I've got to be creating an anti-ski marker plan. Uh, and then on top of that, his crew does have some movement tricks, if I recall correctly. So now i got to be thinking about, oh, how is he stopping me on all the covert ops points? Uh, thankfully, both of those last points, the scoring issues, Molly's activation control really, really helps uh, deal with those issues. Yeah. And I, so like, like follow up was kind of like, what are your best tools? And I, and I think you kind of touched on that, right? That like, just having activation control against, you know, if some of the tricks that Wong has up his sleeves are getting a model to a point or, um, you know, making sure the ski markers are in the right place. Um, it, it, activation control wins games. Yeah. Yeah. And I think especially, uh, covert, uh, uh, operations, uh, it's one of the really solid strategies. What I do with McMorning is um, uh, I would be looking to dominate the table, dominate the fight, and just be like, I'm covering three or, or three or four of the Eve points. You can't stop me scoring them all because I'm just deleting your crew. Um, whereas with Molly, yeah, um, I've got this finesse style of play with this activation control. Uh, with these places of Monos and Archie, uh, I've got uh, the ability to kind of sh shift the skirmish, shift the fight at a moment's notice. Uh, Wong has a little bit of that, but I think Molly's better at it. Mm -hmm. um, so basically, I'll be better at dancing around the board and solving problems, uh, whereas uh, he may, I'm hoping to force him into chasing me around. Sure. We have not really talked about crew yet. Um, so I, and I know you, you said, I think you have most of a list in mind, but again, 24 hours is a long time, um, especially for you, um, but <laughs> give me a ballpark here. What are you, what are you sort of thinking about, um, bringing to this match crew wise? Yeah, so, 
Yeah, so I'm a bit famous for um, uh, swapping lists maybe five or ten times in the space of a couple hours sometimes. Uh, but but at the moment, and I, I, I think with this one, I felt pretty confident with my plan. Uh, so so the, the start of the core of the list is, is double Kruligan, double Enslaved Spirit. Yep. Um, that's 14 stones, and between with that and Molly and the Necrotic Machine, that's already six significant models. I think uh, having a lot of significant models on Covert Ops just really opens up your options, and then this is a challenging scheme pool, which these models really address. So um, I really, really like my scoring option if I'm doing double Kruligan, double Spirit. And that's kind of my default build for Molly on this type of pool now. Um, and I will pivot from that if I need to. I considered a double hang build, which gets very elite and you don't have as much scoring AP. Uh, I don't think that was appropriate here, um, largely because I just need that body count on the field. Sure. Um, I do think he's got good burst damage. He's going to delete a lot of my models. And I need enough models left to score. So that's the double Krugan uh, and Slave Spirit. Next up is Triple Beater. Uh, and so for this game, uh, very easy uh, choices were Archie and Monos. They've got the place that I've been mentioned, the, like the leap uh, that I've been mentioning this whole time, yeah. uh, that uh, this map absolutely um, leap will be defining the game, I think. So yeah. take the two good leap beaters. Uh, third point, um, that's a bit trickier because we don't have another leap beater, which is it's good. That's a good balance thing. We do not give Resurs another model that mobile, <laughs> um, uh, at least with that point of mobility. Uh, so what I'm instead looking at is uh, it's a it's a tie between valedictorian and dead rider. Sure. And so the upside is a valedictorian is a she's got a place she can just hop up on the train tracks like whatever problems arise she can probably deal with it. Yep. Uh, in terms of movement, uh, downside is she's a bit slow, uh, but she does have stun and Bayou is like possibly the worst faction in the game for dealing with the stun. Like not very good at removing it, and they. Uh, are just everyone in Bayou is is very trigger and bonus action oriented. Yeah. Um, there's, there's there's a decent number of models that like say Valedictorian who has done is still a good model, for instance. Um, so she's very very tempting. And the other option is Dead Rider. And what Dead Rider enables for me is more of that mobile, uh, heavy hitting. And so I was leaning towards Valedictorian because I think she's better against what Bayou is trying to do, mm -hmm. except after that previous analysis I was thinking about where how does this matchup work, the Wong player is probably slightly better at the Brawl. I don't want to build for the Brawl with Valedictorian. So I'm thinking I need to take the Dead Rider. I need to scalpel some models. If he throws Alphonse into my crew, I can reap Alphonse into uh, some severe terrain and run away. And I think my play style is very much run away. Sure. And I'm probably, I'm a bit more comfortable with Dead Rider. He's, he might get trapped in terrain and die. And, oh, well. <laughs> So I, I know um, I know there are people out there who look at Dead Rider and say, we've got a two inch two inch melee, we've got um, a min three damage track, we can throw down injured, we can add some extra extra damage on top of that with Revel and Death. Like what I'm getting at here is a lot of people look at Dead Rider and say this is a beat stick. Um, which obviously it's, you know, Dead Rider kills stuff, but um, the way you're talking about Dead Rider is, is a lot more of a finesse piece on the board. Um, do you want to, do you want to talk to that a little bit? Oh, for sure. Yeah. I think all the riders, um, uh, except maybe Hail Rider with Leadline Coat, but generally the riders are, I, I think of them all as finesse pieces. And the reason for that is if you want a brawling piece, there's better options. Like Valedictorian is going to take a lot more hits than the, the riders. Yeah. Uh, they do have their defensive tokens, which don't work on willpower. They don't work on uh, movement duels from Wong. They don't. They don't work on all the other things, uh, and uh, and so they can survive. But if they're doing that, they're not doing much else. Sure. Else to be an eleven stone model, they need to be using their tokens for their utility and for their offense. And to do that, you just need to ensure they're not taking hits. Um, and so that's why I always use all the riders as nest pieces. Um, and people are always surprised when my pal rider lives to turn five and they'll get three or four um, small devastations off during that period. And it's, it's because I think if you use them as nest pieces, they go a lot longer. Sure. Whereas if I want somebody to take some hits, it's Hannah and Bale and, and uh, Rensers, I think. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, I have a personal vendetta against 
all writers. I think I hate them. <laughs> I won't get into that because they're not here about me, but um, they're stupid and I hope they get leave the game someday. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of merit to that these really high cost models start to get very difficult to make them worthwhile uh, yeah. without making them worthwhile. Uh, yeah, for sure. But um, as a, I say I hate them, but like I definitely hire a lot of pale rider in my guild lists, and I have played a lot <laughs> well, of Titania. Right? Right. I, yeah. I, wa I want to be hiring something more fun, but instead I'm hiring this broken piece of garbage. Like. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, I, I cut my teeth on Titania one and, and, um, and, you know, just having a second really aggressive piece and, and I say aggressive, but I think that, you know, I, I did learn to be careful with it because having a rider on turn four is a lot better than having a rider on turn three. Um, <laughs> a lot like that, that difference of tokens is huge and, yeah, um, yeah. you know, ride with me is amazing. And, um, yeah anyways we could we could and and what what oh sorry no go ahead uh one thing to mention about them as uh finesse pieces uh is or as beat sticks is i think that all of them still play a really really great role as a beat stick um what you don't want them doing is brawling or tanking but when they're hitting the opponent it yeah. hits like a truck yeah and the archie mono dead rider trifecta is basically since after my first year of molly i someone recommended this combo to me and i've played it ever since sure and the reason i find it so amazing is they're all mobile but if they want to fight if they want to scrap suddenly they're doing three min three attacks that dead rider triple throw um on its bonus uh revel uh it's for those who don't know the triple bonus uh triple crow bonus um gives you a free attack after giving the injured uh and that is so so powerful all three of those models are effectively three min three attacks yeah. uh when they want to swap to fight if they hit like trucks it's um it's gross it's really gross <laughs> yeah so yeah. that so that is all actually that's a lot like thinking about it now though like that is it that's a that's a ton of of damage going in um but like and and i know molly is very good at very good at drawing cards as well um which is why you're you're able to run a triple beater list like this but um what what are your considerations when you're thinking about hand management when you're bringing in um a, a crew like this because uh this is this is something that i've um talked to people a lot about right when they're bringing a list that has um really more than two high impact pieces that need cards in order to do their thing even with card draw, it's it's easy to run out of steam, and then you're not getting what you, um, what you paid for. And personally, I'm shit at that kind of strategy, right? I want to play Dashiell. I want to summon a bunch of little shitters that I can just throw attacks at and rely on. You know, the deck's gonna help me out eventually. I don't have to think about which cards I'm cheating. Um, so, what are what are you thinking about when you're doing that resource management? And and I guess what are your you know tips for for players who are trying to master that sort of play style yeah it's funny that you had mentioned the other one because the other side of how to handle this is um just flip cards and that's a style i'm actually really bad at uh but what i am good at is, is the hand management and the card management uh so I'll, I'll i i'll try to break it into three chunks um so the first thing you need to do for for a hand management is every turn all 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 of every turn at every point in the game ideally you need to know what your what your mission is what you are trying to accomplish if you're thinking i am doing catch and release with this crew again and at the end of the turn not only is this crew again going to discard a card by your side but archie is going to be leaving then your top priority for the turn or one of your top priorities for the turn is you need to allocate those cards in advance and uh as you go through this you start to solve out okay what am i going to do uh, and at each moment, you can make an assessment of, of whether the card is worth it. And one of my favorite examples of that is I was playing a Molly and Kirai list, um, and my opponent executed Kirai when she had like five health left or mm -hmm. something like that. Um, but I was looking at the board, and I was like, oh, actually, he can kill Kirai in a couple activations anyway. And if I discard this card, I think I had two cards in hand. I was like, I can't actually execute my end of turn plan. Yeah. So I just let my, my master die so that I could discard a card to buy your side. Um, and sometimes I'll end up I'll end up fucking up my calculation. I'll discard an eleven to buy your side or what have you. Um, and I think I, in advance identifying what uh, things you really really need to make happen that turn. Yeah. And then discarding part of them. 
and uh, or saving a card for them. And then uh, you can kind of start to, in advance, you can start flip trying to get some of your TMs out of the way so you have more information. Uh, and then the third trick is uh, something I think I do a lot, which maybe some other players don't because it feels bad, but it helps my KG playstyle, is rotations. And so one of the things I do with the Mono Sarchi Dead Rider rotation is you will almost never see a turn where all three of those models are fighting the enemy crew mm -hmm. in the same turn. Usually one or two of them is re uh, focused on utility or positioning, and then another one is punching punching them. And then uh, often, like, say, end of the turn, Archie goes in and he gets some punches in. But then start of the next turn, Archie doesn't want to die. He leaps, he runs away, he drops some speed markers. Yeah. And so by doing this constant rotating of your beaters, uh, and this is why I like the beaters that are combination steam runners and beaters, because uh, it allows that that rotation effect where you don't have every... Because if if I wanted to use enough cards for all these models, it'd be like two cards for Dead Rider to attack and a bonus, four cards for Archie, like three, yeah. right? We're talking like 20 cards to get my crew on four systems. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so it, it, is, it is very tricky, but I think those three principles really, really help, and that is to identify your objectives, to allocate cards based on those, those objectives, and to rotate some of the models out to uh, uh, tasks that do not require a lot of cards. Um, and not to take unnecessary hits, because you don't want to be cheating de defensively if yep. you don't absolutely need this is always true, but if, if you want to be using every single card in your hand to affect the opponent, you need to be positioning yourself in a way that you're not taking hits, and or just be willing to lose the models. But if your model yeah. counts low, um, you know, you can't afford that. Um, so, it, and it's it sounds like this, this list actually kind of splits the difference there, right? Because you have a lot of, you have a lot of little dudes to run around and and do their job whatever schemey job that might be <clears throat> excuse me um but you've also got your your three big pieces um i did have a question about like going with a pretty wide as in many models a pretty wide list um do you think that's playing into Wong's hand a little bit, or are you, I know you were talking like you know he's going to kill some stuff, so I want redundancies. Like, how is that? How is that push and pull playing out in your mind right now? Yeah, I think the one model I'm a, a little bit nervous about is those enslaved spirits because they do have that issue of like they want to be near other models to be yeah. productive, and they being near other models is, is really really bad against Wong. Uh, I mean, I'm not an expert on it, but that seems like bad news. Uh, that said, my plan is basically to stand the enslaved spirit seven inches away, walk forward four inches, do the chain gang, and then walk away again <laughs> so they're away. <laughs> so that's, that's, that's the kinds of the kinds of tricks I'm used, hoping to use to get around it. And to to address the uh, the build a bit more broadly, uh, this is a build that only uh, arose for me because of GG3. Often I would do like four beaters in a Kruligan sort of list, um, which I think uh, can be really really good. Um, but GD3 is so demanding in terms of scoring yeah. uh, actions in AP. Um, and I think in GD3, the best way to um, win the game is to kill the stuff on your opponent's team that can score enemy points. Like when yeah. I was looking over potential long crews, I was like, you know, one of my number one targets is the totem because the totem is significant and easy to kill. Anything that's significant and easy to kill is getting an Archie punch to the face is my plan. Um, and so I want my crew to be resilient to that. But if he kills two enslaved spirits in a hooligan, I'm, that's okay. I've got more. Right. Um, so what are... Um... What are you thinking about in terms of scheme selection? Uh, obviously, we don't know what um, Cap's bringing here, but um, just uh, what's your hit list in terms of best schemes, worst schemes for this pool for you? Cool. Um, I'll try to start with the worst scheme because normally I try to make all, as many schemes as possible good. Yeah. And in this case, it's one of those bad. Uh, so In Your Face is my worst scheme. Um, so to do in your face, uh, there's a few things. First off, you need a master that's capable of being near the enemy, and Volley 1 is not that. Uh, 
when I picked Molly two or Molly in general, I was conscious that Molly two is really good at in your face. Mm -hmm. Like she she can get in there, score the point, get out. I I I'd have no worries with her. Uh, and then the second thing you need is you need multiple high cost models of the same cost. So sure. uh, a single Ed Rider or a single Valedictorian is not good enough. I did look at some builds. Uh, say if I was McMorning, I would be running Rogue Necromancy and Valedictorian, and I'd be happy. Um, but in your case, just does not work for my build. Uh, the other ones, all of them are live, I think. Uh, I'll mention Vendetta next because it kind of combos with in your face. Uh, a weakness of my list, and yet another reason I wanted to get away from Valedictorian, is uh, that Valedictorian by herself can potentially give up in your face and Vendetta and up down three points. <laughs> that's just that's just miserable. Um, and she's very predictable. She's going to go towards the enemy. My opponent knows it. He can safely declare Vendetta on her and I'll be miserable. Um, so that's why I want the Dead Rider, Manos, Archie. My opponent doesn't know which one's on scheming and which one's on beat. Yeah. Um, much, much harder to score the Vendetta in your face combo against uh, this, this uh, trio. Uh, for me, scoring Vendetta, uh, really, he's got like Alphonse, and that no, <laughs> I don't, I don't think I can kill Alphonse. Yeah. Uh, so not, not going to try that. You can do things like Kruligan's, uh scoring Vendetta, but that requires a lot of setup. Uh, it's a very high risk uh, sort of thing. Sure. Uh, I'm not a fan of it, so it's, uh, it, it's, it's an option I'm keeping on the table. Um, Public demonstration. I have been on record before talking about how terrible the scheme is. Um, triple botanist cannot score public demonstration. But what I realized yesterday is that it is legal for public demonstration to go Kruligan, Kruligan, and Slave Spirit, and Slave Spirit, plus the Necrotic Machine. That's terrible. I can do five models with public demo. I hate and that. what gets worse, what <laughs> it gets worse, because what I can do is I can use activation control to get last activation, walk necrotic me machine ten inches across the board next to where I'm going, or if his hand is empty, even further. Then I can teleport over the crew again, and my necrotic machine started ten inches away, and all of a sudden both models are in position. Wow! Uh, it's. I'm very, very excited about this possibility, and I am going to go my hardest to make this one happen because <laughs> never before, never before have I made a crew where I thought I can do public demonstration with this crew, and now I'm looking at it and I'm like, holy shit, this is my moment. Uh, so that's exciting. Um, I, um, sabotage? Oh, sorry. I just, I, I don't remember the numbers offhand, but public demonstration does have the worst stats of any scheme from the the gaining from the GG3 that was played in the series this year um it's it's pick rate is <laughs> it's pick rate is terrible like just nobody was picking it and of those picks it was like not scored so um oh my goodness so well someone needs to do it show us show us why public <laughs> demonstration is the new meta <laughs> what i'm so excited about and this is what makes Bell so great right cuz my last round I was like, I said, I said to the other people in New Zealand, the other Kiwi was in the meta, I'm going to do spread them out and load them up on ski markers. And they were like, what are you stupid? Like, what are you talking about? And then I did that and I won the game 8-2 because what I managed to do was create a problem my opponent couldn't solve. And I love in Malifaux that there's some, like, there's these schemes that are obviously terrible so much of the time. Yep. And one of my favorite stories was spread them out is I was playing against my friend playing Tara in a tournament. And like halfway through turn three, he was like, wait, did you take spread them out? What are you doing? I was like, yeah, I took spread them out. Can you stop me? And he said, no, he couldn't. And I got both my points in that game. And it's just, I, I, it's, I love that about Malifo. So if we can do spread them out plus load last round and then public demo this round, I feel like what a way to close out the year. Sure. I love it. I can't <laughs> wait to see that happen. Um, all right. So we've got sabotage and set the trap left. Um, what's, yeah. uh, what's going on there? So uh, let's go with set the trap uh, because I think I think set the trap combos very very well with the public demo plan for my particular crew. The reason being very easy to get necrotic machine into position. Krulian teleports over, drops a scheme that scores the uh, points, um, and boom, I've, I've got set the trap. So this is my plan A: public demo, uh, set the trap. 
uh, where my plan A fails is if he makes a crew that I look at and I'm like, he's not going to bunch his models up, that's when I got to go for, for plan B. Um, and my plan B is probably going to be sabotage. Uh, again, we'll have to see the exact composition of his crew, but against Wong, I think that that's pretty reasonable. Because uh, the, the problem with sabotage for me is that um, it takes a lot of work yep. to, to score. Um, you have to go away from the strategy markers, and going away from the strategy markers is always inherently inefficient. Um, so I basically require Archie spending a turn off going and scoring with the Krulligan. Um, it's efficient. I, I can, I can, it's consistent. I can probably score those points every time, but it's taking a lot of stuff away from the rest of my game plan, yeah. um, which is, is a big cost. So I prefer to avoid it. On the flip side, we've got this Wong player, freaking Wong. He's got a uh, launch into space on ski markers. He can put two ski markers down anywhere on the map. And he can just be like, ha ha. And what's even worse is he can do this over and over. So I'm worried that if he's a clever player, he's going to do this and do it on the wrong piece of terrain. <laughs> so I'm going to send my crew over to stop him and eat his markers. And then it'll turn out the next turn he does it on the opposite side of the map. Oh my and gosh. that's what I would do if I was the wrong player. Um, so in the game, you may see me uh, looking at a situation and looking at uh, obvious sabotage, like a super obvious sabotage, and weighing whether or not to spend resources dealing with it. And people might be like, Cackle, why are you not denying his point? That seems worth it. It's because in my head, I've got this paranoid fucking like, he might be, he might be fucking with me. Um, so there's a chance I'm going to wait till he reveals sabotage, and then I'm going to stop the second point. Because... I'm upset because I've been, <laughs> I've been trying to break some of my locals from the habit of like spending too many actions denying points and now because you've said this they're gonna or just not denying points um bluffing right spending too many actions <laughs> bluffing schemes now you said this and they're gonna go back to wasting six ap trying to like i don't know spread them out or set the trap or something <laughs> I'll, take, I'll, I'll go a little bit more in depth then because do not try this at home because the reason this might work is because Wong is going to have a plan A. His plan A is like, let the opponent uh, gather up in the deployment zone. I'm going to nuke him. Yeah. And I'm saying, no, you can't have your plan A. So then he's going to have his plan B of like, okay, I'm going to get in your face. I'm going to fight. Your crew is going to die. And I'm saying, no, I don't want to allow that to happen. Fuck your plan B. So hopefully he'll go, uh, okay, fine, plan C. I'm going to use his activation to throw some ski markers to fuck with you. And so that's so like, um, I I think it's fair to say I have an abnormal brain. I I'm not classified as what you would say is neurotypical. <laughs> and so this is a very very extreme case. Uh, normally, uh, unless power ritual, power ritual is the main exception out of all the schemes. Normally, I don't think it's worth spending too much effort bluffing. It's and and, and the the key is is <laughs> like one fun. actually has this unique situation where it's free right or like yeah. um droughts drought secrets on um lawyers for example yeah. right like you're you're if you have uh the card to throw away a drought secret somewhere to make it look like you're not actually you're not then you're not actually spending any actions for it um and uh yeah wong wong has pretty pretty it's in a pretty unique situation to to take advantage of that, but it's not. Um, um, if it's a close game, most most crews simply don't have the actions to spare to be able to bluff something. Yeah, I I think that when when you're playing Molly versus Wong, all conventional wisdom goes out the window. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna be a wild match for sure it's the weirdest game i have prepared for all year yeah. it just is completely unlike anything else i have uh considered like i i was prepared to fight ma Tuckett. i was i was i had a plan for her wong is a curveball <laughs> which is really which is really exciting i was i was joking with cap that he um um he just he, he, by picking Wong, he guaranteed that everybody is cheering for him this game. Like nobody, nobody wants to see you win with Molly again. Everybody wants to see Wong take it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm still going to try to crush his things, so. though. <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> um, 
Well, any, any, uh, we've been chatting a little bit here. Um, any closing thoughts about the, the match before we sign off? Um, about the match specifically, I think it's, it's going to, as I said, it's just the wildest match I could possibly think of. It's going to be very, very great. Um, for everyone else, um, for my Malifaux playing, getting involved with the online community uh, and, and playing some Vassal games in the World Series is probably one of the best gaming experiences I've, I've ever had. Uh, it's been really, really great. It really takes the game towards the next level. Um, so yeah, I would recommend anyone who's keen uh, to try out the series next year. It's it's completely worth it. Like uh, you do not you do not have to play at the level that I'm playing at. And it's completely okay to come in at these these other tables. This is this is the championship game we're talking about. Uh, there there are a lot of other types of players in the series, and you will have a good time. And and frankly, like I, I think that you're a great example of a player who's capable of playing at a at a very high level. You're you're capable of making it here making it through the championship playing in the championship but i think that if if you run into a new player you know a new player comes in the series uh, faces off against you same with same with angel actually same with cap right like um so many people are are just fun to play against um yeah. uh, you, both both of you are are amazing examples as um advocates for the game and 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 you know sort of um, just advocates for a, a good new player experience and, and you're not going to lose a game that counts, but like, you're also not going to crush someone's dreams for daring to, to put their toe into the deep end of the pool. Right. Like it's, there's, a, there's a lot of fun that happens in the series as well. And I think, I think people will level up so fast. The only reason I am anywhere near as good as I am is because I joined the series. Uh, you, you really encounter a lot of people who will help you with your builds, who will explain things, who will, who will walk you through their reasoning. Uh, and of course, uh, you sometimes give some less than helpful advice, but by and large, almost all of it is like some really, really helpful advice yeah. that helps you up your game. For sure. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, I, I think you should play too. I'm, I'm a little biased, but <laughs> everybody should, everybody should do it. It's, it's great. Um, cool. Well, uh, thank you very much for taking the time to chat. Um, and, uh, we will, we'll see each other again soon for, for the game. And then people are going to be able to see that not too long after this video gets posted. So, um, yeah. Good luck in the championship, Cackle. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks for watching, everyone, and we'll try to make a good game for it.